Right. Roman, Roman Catholicism was created at the Council of Nicaea through Constantine. So you have this parallel between Mohammed, Constantine, heretic, uh, uh, um, infidel, heretic, jihad, crusade. They have central cities. And with Romanism, you have Rome as a central city. In Islam, you have Mecca as a central city. Hmm. So, so these parallels are identical. And we should not be surprised, therefore, because the papacy existed almost 300 years before Islam. Islam was founded in 610 A.D. Mm -hmm. uh, Romanism was founded in 325. The first pope is Sericius, and about uh, 399 he's called pope. Uh, but the first uh, pope to be given universal spiritual power was in 606 with uh, Gregory. So, so you have the establishment of Romanism with all of its beginning powers and universal um, uh, spiritual power over every human creature uh, four years before the founding of Islam. And the, the, the papacy could not reach to Arabia to carry out its decrees. So cre it created what is called the second son. Islam is the second son, uh, really, of the devil. And so Islam, being an extension of Romanism, it would carry out the essential doctrines of Rome under the guise of another religion. Hmm. Interesting. And, you know, the, the question, of course, is, and you brought this up, why, why because, again, on the surface, uh, for someone who is, you know, new to, to a subject like this, it can't get it through, you know, why would the Vatican be instrumental in creating an enemy of the Christian faith, because that goes, uh, you know, obviously against logic, but what you were saying here, and to clarify that again, is that they're using this in order to create uh, a, a, this, this uh, dichotomy, if you will, of these warring factions, and in such a war, with uh, such huge battles going on, you can consequently control populations better, you can kill off a lot of people that you're, uh, basically, you want to get rid of. Is, is that correct, Eric? That's, that's correct. And the other thing we want to remember is we always must just define true Bible-based Christianity as those people who believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for their sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again and coming back. And the Bible is the final authority for faith and practice of a true Christian. Romanism, on the other hand, has never been Christian. It is not Christian. It will never be Christian. It is papal mystery Babylon religion, as I show in this uh, CD that's available that I mentioned. So Romanism is not Christian. Only true Bible-believing people who hold the Bible as their final authority of faith and practice, like the old Lutheran Church that was so prevalent in Sweden, which gave the Swedish people victory uh, during the Thirty Years' War led by the great Gustavus Adolphus. Uh, that kind of Bible-based Christianity that Gustavus, uh, Gustavus adhered to was what made a nation great. So we, can, we must always distinguish between pagan Romanism and Bible-based true uh, primitive first century and Reformation Christianity. Mm. You know, one other thing that comes up, uh, you know, as a consequence to this, the reason why I wanted to address the background potentially of this is that this has uh, uh, progressed and continued up into to our time, so to speak. We have, of course, something called the uh, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, uh, and there's many authors that have written about the, the connections between the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the Nazis, and, and even progressing up from that up to Al-Qaeda. Have you looked into these connections as well, Eric? Sure. Um, to, to first talk about the Muslim Brotherhood, you must talk about the Masonic Grand Orient Lodge of Cairo and Istanbul. Those two lodges in the Near East are the most powerful Muslim lodges. Out of the Grand Lodge in Cairo comes the mother Muslim Brotherhood. And the black pope, the Jesuit general who controls the white pope, Pope Benedict XVI, is the black pope through his army of Jesuits that controls all Freemasonry, be it Scottish Rite in the West or Grand Orient in the East, and therefore he controls all the leaders out of Grand Orient Freemasonry, which include the Islamic leaders. For example, Saddam Hussein was one. Another one was King Hussein of Jordan. Another one was Ataturk of Turkey. Another one is Muammar Gaddafi of Libya. All these Muslim leaders are high-level Grand Orient Freemasons, and thus they are controlled by the Vatican. 
So the Masonic connection to the Muslim Brotherhood can never be overlooked. Oh. Second of all, we, we know that after World War II, that many of your top Nazis were, were brought out of Europe by means of the Jesuits uh, using their Vatican rat, rat lines, also called the Odessa. And uh, many of these top Nazis went into the Near East. They went into Egypt. Uh, Dudley Wanger, who was one of the heads of the Einstein groupies in uh, the East, he went into Cairo. And then you have a couple who went into Damascus. Uh, but you have these high Nazi SS officers that have gone down into these Muslim nations and aided and abetted and have been helpful in establishing the Muslim Brotherhood. We have the PLO. The PLO is led by Yasser Arafat. His uncle was Haji Min al Husseini. He was a Freemasonic a hoodlum, a Muslim, who was made the uh, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem by Herbert Samuel. And Herbert Samuel was a Masonic Jew in England, in Britain, and because Britain had command of that land, breaking up the Ottoman Empire after World War I, they set up all their puppets in the new countries that they created. And one of their puppets for the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was Haji Min al Husseini. He was a Freemason. So the Jesuits in control of Britain and America for the entire duration of the 20th century set up all these Muslim leaders who were high-level Freemasons secretly subordinate to the Pope. Now, Eric, explain to us again and clarify for us the connection there between Freemasonry and the Vatican, because again, on the surface, a lot of people looking at this, they recognize the, the most of the Freemasonic brands, it's, it's more... Uh, clinging to a Protestant faction than uh, to a Catholic one, but but explain that for us and what is the connection there? Okay, the remember that the Vatican always has an outward policy, but it is false, and then it has a secret policy, and that is the true policy. So the open policy of the papacy has, for the last two hundred years at least, been anti-Masonic that no Roman Catholic, at least till John Paul II made it okay for Roman Catholics to join the Lodge, but that no no Roman Catholic could join the Masonic Lodge or else he would be excommunicated. Yeah, yeah. That was, are you with me there? Yeah, yeah. That, that's the open policy, or was the open policy of the Vatican till John Paul II. The real policy is that the Jesuits wrote the first, first, first 25 degrees of Scottish Rite Freemasonry in 1754 in the College of Clermont in France, Paris, France. I have that documented from a Masonic source, and it's in my book. So the Jesuits, in creating Scottish Rite, the first 25 degrees, they then created the eight rites after that with Frederick the Great, when Frederick the Great, who was the head Freemason on the continent, protected the Jesuit order when Pope Clement suppressed the Jesuits with a papal bull in 1773, abolishing and extinguishing the Society of Jesus forever. And so it was Frederick II, or the Great, of Prussia, and it was Catherine II, the Great, of Russia, who were these two monarchs protecting the Jesuits during their 41-year suppression from 1773 to 1814. And during this time, the Jesuits were the masters of high-level Freemasonry, and they used their, their Grand Orient Masonic Lodge, in particular, on the continent, to foment and ignite the French Revolution. Right. And in, in igniting the French Revolution with Robespierre, who was Jesuit trained, the Jesuits then eliminated thousands of their enemies, including many Dominican priests, and then they um, they uh, brought Napoleon Bonaparte to power from Corsica. Yeah. And the Jesuits had been suppressed by the Pope. They had been expelled from South America. So some 2,000 Jesuits had been sent back from South America, from, the, from Paraguay and the, and, the, and the holdings of Portugal and Spain, because the Portuguese and the Spanish monarchs suppressed them out of their countries and out of all their holdings. So some 2,000 Jesuits were sent back to, to, uh, to Rome, and they then populated the island of Corsica, off the coast of France. Well, it's no, it's no coincidence that Napoleon would arise from Corsica. So Napoleon was the great avenger 
for the Jesuit order in punishing the Roman Catholic monarchs of Europe for suppressing the Jesuits, for punishing the Pope, for imprisoning Pius VII for five years until he would agree to 